Arustan in Afghanistan and was the RCC construction engineer for the RCC in Labrador, Canada, completed in 2018. He has been evaluating the performance of RCC dams since 1985, including LCRCC, MCRCC, and HCRCC dams, and is author of I Call Bulletin 177, Chapter 7, Performance of RCC dams. Now I request my colleague to play the presentation received from Mr. Tim Donnan. Over to the IT team, please. Good day. My name is Tim Dolan. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you on Chapter 7, Performance of RCC Dams. I have nearly 40 years experience in RCC dam development, including RCC materials and mixture proportioning, laboratory testing, core drilling and evaluation, construction quality control, and on-site construction oversight. I've had 33 years with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Concrete Laboratory, followed by 10 years as an independent RCC and mass concrete dam consultant. I've worked on site with virtually every major dam, RCC dam construction methodology and under conditions ranging from equatorial climates to subarctic. I've been evaluating the performance of RCC dams since 1985, including core drilling and testing of low, medium and high cementitious RCC dams from 28 days age to 24 years after construction. The performance of RCC dams includes some dams constructed while RCC mixtures and construction methods were less refined and those constructed with more emphasis on workable mixtures and improved construction equipment and methods. This presentation will focus on performance of early and modern RCC dams with an emphasis on lift line, performance, performance of dam facing and contraction joint systems, performance of some repair methodologies, durability of RCC, and performance under unusual extreme loading conditions. Some of the early dams were constructed out of RCC had less than satisfactory performance. RCC dam performance can be improved with careful attention to the practices summarized in the updated ICOL report. Two of the principal issues of the early dams included seepage of poorly compacted lift lines due to less workable mixtures and leakage due to lack of induced contraction joints. Modern RCC dams, generally beginning in the 1990s, have had satisfactory performance due to utilizing more workable mixtures with a VB consistency less than 20 seconds using the 12.5 kg surcharge. Uh, improved lift surface exposure criteria and the use of set retarding admixtures. Improved methods and equipment for dam facing and dam contraction joints. RCC dams now have performance equivalent to conventional vibrated mass concrete dams under a variety of conditions. Some of the terms adopted for RCC dam construction, particularly the nomenclature for lift lines, had roots in historic mass CVC construction. Traditional mass CVC dams utilize a series of about 45 centimeter thick freshly placed layers that were constructed to build up one 1.5 to 3 meter high lift with rigid attention to cold joint cleaning prior to uh, subsequent placements. RCC dam construction may have a series of rapidly placed layers on hot joints, followed by planned or unplanned cold joints 
with comparable lift surface cleaning requirements. However, RCC dam construction placements have much larger surface areas of exposed uh, either layer or lift lines, requiring different methodologies to achieve satisfactory performance. LM has similarities to original mass CVC construction. However, with LM, RCC construction typically progresses continuously from one abutment to the other, eliminating the traditional block construction approach. On my last RCC dam, it took about three weeks to complete the placement of one three meter high sloping layer lift from one abutment to the other. Other dam placement methodologies may use components of the standard 300 millimeter lift placement sloping layer method and use large sectional blocks to assure that the placements are always on hot joints. Requirements for lift line performance. To achieve satisfactory lift line performance, it is essential to have a workable RCC mixture. Typically, this involves a loaded VB time less than 20 seconds, which will greatly reduce segregation and allow for good consolidation. Secondly, the lift surface exposure condition must be identified utilizing the appropriate definition criteria for cleaning and treatment of hot, warm, and cold joints. This may range from no treatment on hot joints to significant measures on cold joints or extended cold joints. Bedding mortar and grout are common on cold joints. Often, increased production is associated with more hot joints, improved lift line performance, and overall cost savings are reduced. The fresh properties of RCC greatly influence concrete dam performance. A workable RCC mixer will have a consistency that will allow full compaction in four to eight roller passes, normally less than 20 seconds. This also reduces segregation. Low VB times can have better mixing action and incorporate chemical admixtures. And VB times of eight to 12 seconds have incorporated air and training admixtures. Most compaction specifications, however, don't address air and train RTC. One of the most important <coughs> changes in modern RCC construction involves the utilization of set retarders to delay the onset of forming warm and cold joints. You have a longer time for compaction, longer time for RCC in facing interface consolidation, and the hot joint time is extended. This has led to excellent lift line performance, as much as 90% or higher bonded hot joints to ensure nearly monolithic performance. One caution is that extended set retarded times will also be more vulnerable to exposure from temperature, either hot or cold, and more exposure to rainfall. The VB consistency of RCC greatly influences dam performance. At Upper Stillwater Dam in 1985, the VB time averaged about 30 seconds, and cores drilled showed about 60% bonded lift lines. The VB time was changed to an average of about 17 seconds, and the percent bonded lift lines increased to about 90%. Thus, a more workable RCC mixture has better dam performance. The lift line performance of hot joints is excellent. In many cases, it's comparable to mass concrete layers. Warm joints can have variable performance as evidenced by less bonding. This can be attributed to the equipment use and duration of the lift surface cleaning. In some cases, it's difficult to clean using brushing on a warm joint, and this inevitably leads to a cold joint and then slow production. After cleaning, cold joints can have excellent performance if properly cleaned, followed by supplemental bedding and bonding mortar or concrete. This is particularly advantageous for low cementitious mixtures that have a high VB consistency. This slide shows the performance of drilled cores using some different construction methodologies. 90% um, hot joints 
had the upper one, which had excellent bonding. Vacuum only was used at Upper Stillwater Dam in the USA with good bonding, and then mortar on all joints used in Brazilian dams. The results of several coring programs for both low cementitious and high cementitious RCC dams in the USA showed the benefits of utilizing the bedding mixtures for the low cementitious uh, mixes and a workable RCC mixture on lift line bonding. The low cementitious lift line bonding improved to from about 24% bonded lift lines without treatment to over 90% bonded lift lines. And the high cementitious RCC bonding improved from 60% to 90% when the VB consistency was decreased from an average of 30 to an average of 17 seconds. And this was using the 22.7 kg surcharge. Based on uh, the results of both different replacement methodologies, come up with a conclusion on so drill cool. Greater than 90% bonded lift joints is excellent. From 70 to 90% is satisfactory and similar to many CVC mass concrete dams. 50% to 70% bonded lift lines is less than satisfactory, and less than 50% bonded lift lines is unsatisfactory and may need further remediation uh, in the future. This slide shows the effect of compaction on compressive strength. To the left has a density of 2,610 kilograms per cubic meter density, about 9 to 100% of the maximum density achievable. It has a compressive strength of 23 MPa, about 95% of the maximum achieved. To the right is a poorly compacted core from the same mixture with a density of 2,290 kilograms to the or about 88% of the maximum achievable density. It had a strength of or 21% of the maximum achievable compressive strength. This is a graph of the in-situ density of RCC versus compressive strength. As with conventional concrete, RCC typically will lose about 4 to 6 percent strength for every percentage of entrapped air that could have been removed with satisfactory compaction. Typical RCC specifications require an average of about 98 percent of theoretical air-free density and a minimum of 95 percent. In this case, a 10 percent decrease in density or 90 percent compaction resulted in about a 50% loss in strength. This slide compares the direct vessel strength of high cementitious RCC to low cementitious RCC cores. The slides include both parent concrete and lift joints combined. It should be noted that the low cementitious RCC had lower percent bonded lift lines compared to the high cementitious RCC. This is a graph of tensile strength performance of parent RCC versus RCC lift lines. In the USA database of high cementitious and low cementitious mixtures, the average direct tensile strength of lift lines was about 80% of the parent RCC. RCC tensile strength ranged from about 3.5 to 5.5% of the compressive strength. This is a table of RCC core strength from USA database. The results of drilled RCC core shows the following properties can be achieved. The low cementitious uh, results also include with and without supplemental bonding treatment for the tensile strength test results. This table shows the direct shear properties of some RCC cores from the USA, including parent concrete and at lift lines. It has high cementitious RCC with about 90% bonded lift joints, low cementitious RCC without voids that were 50 to 65% bonded joints, and low cementitious with voids 
that had about 25% bonded joints. Notice that the low cementitious with bedding had 90% bonded lift joints and excellent shear strength properties. This shows the shear strength performance of bonded RCC lift lines from several projects. It includes the USA for all bonded RCC joints, includes Vietnam with 365 day hot joints and cold joints that were essentially the same, and from Brazil on cores at 180 days using bedding mortar. This compares the shear strength performance of parent RCC versus lift lines. For the USA database, the average cohesion of lift lines was about 65% of the parent RCC strength. Long-time shear tests from drilled cores at Upper Stillwater Dam showed lift lines averaged about 75% of the parent RCC strength but this included plastic or hot joints, warm joints and cold joints. No supplemental bonding mixtures were used and hot and warm joints were cleaned by vacuum truck. The shear strength of the plastic slash hot joints was very comparable to the parent RCC, whereas the warm and cold joints were about two thirds of the strength of the parent material. This graph compares the shear strength performance of high cementitious and low cementitious RCC from the USA. The high cementitious mixtures had a VB consistency less than 20 seconds. And this is 100% of the paste around the periphery of the surcharge weight. The low cementitious mixtures had VB consistency about 60 seconds, and they also had lower percentages of bonding. This shows the shear strength performance of RCC and the effect of poor compaction. Poor compaction resulted in about a 50% decrease in, co in cohesion. Some recent testing of low cementitious RCC without bonding mixtures resulted in essentially no cohesion, even for what was considered bonded lift joints. Low friction values are generally under 40 degrees and were obtained from poorly compacted lift joints. The next two slides show the shear strength performance of RCC and the effects of poor compaction. This fully compacted mixture has a density of over 2,600 kilograms per cubic meter. And for a normal stress of 7.7 MPA, it had a shear strength of 3.7 MPA. This slide shows one that was poorly compacted, a density of less than 2,500 kilograms per cubic meter, or about 95% compaction. For the same normal stress of 0.7 MPA, it had a shear strength of 1.2 MPA, or 30% of the fully compacted strength. And this is on ones that were recovered intact. Properties were less for those that were not recovered intact. This shows the effects of poor compaction on sliding friction resistance or phi angle. The fully compacted ones with generally a rough surface had a phi of 53 degrees. For voids that were smaller than about uh, two uh, millimeters, the fee angle was reduced to 43 degrees. And for large rock pockets and voids on a lift surface, the fee angle was down to 35 degrees. So there's a significant decrease in friction resistance with poorly compacted lift lines. Several low cementitious RCC dams have had performance issues related to lift line permeability and lack of bond due to lack of compaction. Some have required post-construction remediation. Lack of bond and tension and shear strength are critical performance parameters for sliding stability and under seismic loading. One of the primary factors influencing lack of compaction is a high VB consistency, generally 60 seconds or higher. On some of these structures, more than 50% of the lift lines were not bonded. 
There's documented performance that mixtures with high VB times had segregation, low compaction, and little or no bond or cohesion. The proper VB consistency tests must be performed. And this is the ASTM C1170 test. Pace must be observed around 100% of the perimeter of the surcharge mass for it to be a valid test. The performance of RCC dam facing has greatly improved over the years. This includes form concrete facing, grout enriched, grout enriched GERCC or grout enriched vibrated RCC facing, and those with impermeable membranes, such as PVC membranes and applied membranes. But the performance has improved with more workable RCC mixtures, use of set retarders, and the grout enriched GERCC or GEVR methods. Most RCC dams have improved overall dam facing and contraction joint systems using a variety of methodologies, including CVC facing, GERCC, and GEVR. The interface between facing and RCC has improved with the use of workable RCC mixtures and set retarders. Other performance parameters include impermeability features. Contraction joint performance is, includes construction of induced contraction joints, construction of water stop and drainage systems, performance of purposely grouted contracting joints, and the performance of some repairs. Methods of inducing contraction joints using thin steel sheeting or thick mill plastic have achieved tolerances of plus or minus 25 millimeters of alignment. The performance of RCC dam contraction joint methodologies is improving. Well-designed and constructed contraction joints have had very good performance. Some performance issues have been caused by design and construction deficiencies with contraction joints and drain systems. Inadequate support of the contraction joint material, inadequate support of water stop, and misalignment have resulted in unsatisfactory performance. The performance of attached post construction membranes has been quite satisfactory for new construction and for seepage reduction of existing dams. Proper insulation is necessary to assure satisfactory performance. Spray-on membranes have ranged from poor to satisfactory performance. It is essential that the proper surface treatment be performed and that the membrane be debonded where it crosses cracks to assure sufficient elongation across the crack. Urethane crack injection flowing and moving cracks has initially been successful in reducing leakage, but it's only been temporary. Grouting was ineffective after about five years, in part due to crack movement. A post-construction crack repair was done at Upper Stillwater Dam using a steel cutoff that was inserted transverse to the crack. It was very expensive. Vertical slots were cut into the dam by line drilling techniques. A full depth stainless steel panel was installed in the slot, and then it was embedded with a liquid asphalt. Post construction crack repair using the cutoff was very successful, but expensive. The steel membrane stopped all leakage. Durability performance of RCC includes performance in freezing thaw environments or a freeze thaw attack, abrasion and erosion resistance, and alkali aggregate reaction. The freeze thaw durability of non iron trained RCC and low cementitious RCC in particular is very poor. Not only does this present a maintenance issue for removal of deteriorated concrete, but it also has reduced dam cross-section and affected the performance of the unlined RCC spillway. 
freeze-cell performance of RCC cores and cast cylinders was greatly improved with air entrainment. Properly air entrained RCC can achieve performance meeting the criteria of conventional concrete in rapid freezing thawing tests. The USBR minimum was 500 cycles for satisfactory performance. Not only is the free cell performance of RCC impacted by entrained air, but also by compaction. To the left is a fully compacted air entrained RCC core that had about 1,795 cycles of free saw resistance. To the right is one that on the overall compaction was about 93%. However, in the center along lift lines, the compaction was about 85%, and the free saw durability was reduced to about 630 free saw cycles. Thus, both air entrainment and percent compaction impact the overall durability of RCC in freezing and thawing. RCC durability for well-compacted concrete is much the same as conventional mass concrete. Abrasion erosion resistance is primarily enhanced by higher compressive strength. Low strength RCC has suffered significant damage from abrasion erosion action. One RCC dam has documented alkali aggregate reaction due to using reactive aggregates and a high alkali cement. However, this was predicted as it was only a temporary structure. Most RCC mixers use fly ash or other poslins, so the potential for AAR is greatly reduced with good quality poslins. To date, RCC dams have performed satisfactorily under seismic events. RCC dams that have overtopped, including coffer dams, have been satisfactory. The Camera Dam in Brazil failed in 2004, resulting in five fatalities and extensive home and economic loss. The failure mode was attributed to erosion of weathered rock and at joint seams within the dam foundation. However, poor compaction at lift lines was noted on exposed surfaces. Satisfactory performance of spillways has been achieved with RCC. The facing on the left was made with formed air entrained RCC and was overtopped shortly after construction. The Ochoco Dam spillway plunge pool was operated within about six months of completion with satisfactory performance. Several embankment dams that were protected with downstream RCC facing have been overtopped in the USA with satisfactory performance. This has become a common method to rehabilitate dams in the USA with inadequate spillway capacity. RCC dam construction methodologies have significantly improved since the early dams constructed in the 1980s and resulted in improved performance. However, we must not forget the consequences of unsatisfactory performance. Although RCC dam construction methodologies have greatly improved since the early dams constructed in 1980s, we must not forget the consequences of unsatisfactory performance. We must first admit to deficiencies that they exist and develop and disseminate solutions. The information in Bulletin 177 has significantly improved the state of the art of RCC dams and documentation of good performance. In conclusion, the performance of RCC dams has improved significantly, some comparable to CVC dams. The improved workability of RCC has greatly decreased lift line compaction issues. A VB consistency less than 20 seconds is recommended. And this is for the VB time when the pace goes all the way around the full perimeter of the surcharge. High VB consistency has resulted in segregation, low compaction, and poor or no bond with reduced sliding resistance on several low cementitious RCC dams. Supplemental bedding mixtures are necessary to achieve satisfactory performance for bonding and impermeability in low cementitious RCC. Lift line performance improved with hot joints and cleaning and cold joint treatment methodology.
lift line and dam facing performance improved using set retarding admixtures. Contraction joint performance is satisfactory, provided good construction methodology is followed. Freezing and thawing performance greatly improved with air and training admixtures at low dB times. Abrasion erosion resistance is improved with increased compressive strength. RCC is not resistant to alkali aggregate reaction unless appropriate measures are taken. Spillway and dam overtopping performance has been satisfactory. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for making an excellent and detailed presentation on RCC dam performance of dam, safe, dam facing system contraction joints and repairs. May we proceed further for the question answer session? May I request to the participants for their questions, please? May I request to the participants for their questions? We have one hand raised by Mr. S. Chaudhary. Uh, I want to know whether uh, uh, you have uh, uh, designed, uh, tested a material uh, if, uh, from a coat of a layer which has been casted during rain. What's the effect of rain on these strength parameters of RCC? Would you like me to answer that question? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Um, at Muskrat Falls Dam in Canada, we had rain about uh, one third of the time which was one of the uh, primary reasons we went to sloping layer methodology. And my first response is that you, for most, under most circumstances, do not place RCC in the rain, it is to stop and to protect it surface. If it has been well compacted and is not, uh, has, has started to uh, set up, it should not be significantly damaged by rain. However, if you attempt to compact and seal the surface during the rain, you're going to have to remove that surface using, uh, essentially using a cold joint lift surface treatment to remove the surface. Uh, additionally, vacuum uh, truck uh, on operating on the surface immediately after rain is an excellent uh, method of cleaning and removing surface paste. So if you take the wet paste that has been rained on, remove that from the surface, uh, you have excellent performance. Uh, the cores from Canada that you showed with 100% lift line uh, hot, uh, cold joints also had many lifts that we stopped and protected the lift and then went into removing the top skin or the top surface. Um, we, the first year we had no vacuum truck. So the primary uh, purpose uh, or primary lift clean was essentially to stop and wait. And sometimes you needed to wait from two to four or even six hours before you could begin brooming the surface to remove it. Um, the reason for this is the brooming creates quite a bit of debris. So the brooming is not the problem, it's the removal of the broom material that becomes very problematic because the volume is quite high. So you need to wait long enough so when you broom it, you're only taking the top surface off. But the same materials after rain we use with vacuums and we were able to remove it and continue on within about one to two hours of a hard rain on the surface. 
Can I say also... Excuse me? Ballpark figure of how much intensity we can proceed with how much intensity of rain? Like in AFC, they tell three millimeter per hour or something like that. Sur surprisingly, the three millimeter per hour, I believe that's in many specifications, came from Upper Stillwater Dam in 1985 and was somewhat of a guess. I'm surprised okay. that it's okay. I'm surprised that it's still there. Visually, if you see pace collecting uh, on the surface, which is fairly obvious to see, you should stop. Uh, it's mostly about whether there's visible pace on the surface, and it's quite obvious when you see it under a roller that you very rapidly turn it almost into a slurry. Uh, so it's a little bit to me, it's a little bit more as visual. Thank you. Thank you for your. Yeah, we also went to sloping layer. One of the reasons for it is water runs downhill. So during any form, any rain event, that water is going to go down to the bottom. So it's much more easily collected using the sloping layer methodology in rainy environments. So uh, uh, your suggestion is, if it is a rainy environment, we should consider a slopey layer method as well as use of vacuum trucks? Um, I, would I would consider that um, the other alternative is to divide your dam into blocks. So if you do have if you do have a rain event that might cause uh, you to, to stop, you need to have someplace else to go while you're doing that uh, lift surface cleaning. So if you have another place to go, and it doesn't interfere with your production to perform the, the necessary cleanup. Um, that's an alternative, and that's also been used quite successfully. Uh, that's what we had uh, in Vietnam. We had large blocks about uh, the size of one half of a football field um, of surface area. That's quite a bit to clean. So if you can stop there and move elsewhere to another block, you do not interfere with your production, even though even if you are stopped by a rain event. Thank you. Any further questions? So in case the participant would like to ask any further question, they may write to us. CBIP, the organizer, will arrange the answer from consulting with the speaker and revert back to you over the email. Okay. Um, if you have not. Uh, yeah, participant not, doesn't have any further questions. Okay. Uh, I do want to say um, you heard it enough times that you must have the appropriate VB consistency to achieve consolidation. Without full consolidation of every lift line, you greatly impact your performance. So if you do not have compaction, you do not have performance. I recently uh, finished consulting on one structure that had very poor compaction. And although there may have been some cement savings on the mixture by not doing bedding mortar or bedding concrete on the surface of every lift, the consequences and the rehabilitation may approach a half a billion dollars. Uh, so it is absolutely critical that you have a workable mixture and it's absolutely critical that you have a minimum of 98% and preferably 90%, 99% compaction. And this can only be achieved by having a suitable VB consistency. And one of the issues in that is the VB consistency test was not done correctly. And they only stopped the test when they first saw some paste on the surcharge, not around the entire perimeter of the surcharge. It was the wrong test to use. So it was a low cementitious mix. They did not use mortar on the surfaces of every lift. And consequently, 
there is significant 50 to 75 percent unbonded lift lines. So I cannot, uh, must, must have the compaction in order to achieve performance. Can, uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah, uh, if you can hear me, Mr. Tim, uh, whether uh, have you ever had an experience with working with limestone dust in an RCC dam? <sighs> Cement and limestone dust only, as a mixture, no SCM, other SCM. Um, there have been. Uh... One of the major, I should say, one change in materials over the years has been incorporating crusher finds from quarry operations. This has generated a lot of dust, a fracture, uh, less than 0.075 uh, millimeters, and about 5% or so as a percentage of the total aggregate finds. So this has been done, I know, in uh, granites, sandstones, and I am not specifically aware of whether the fines were introduced through a quarry crushing operation in limestone, um, but that is now becoming quite common as a cement, an additive in cement in the United States. So whether you take fines in the quarry, from a limestone quarry, let's say, or do you add it as a supplementary, or somewhat as a uh, dust or fracture, either in the cement or alone? Um, it is becoming very common in regular concrete in the United States. So not specifically as an addition uh, in RCC. Normally, it's been done as a poslin. And uh, as I say that, I also uh, I'm just starting to recall that in Brazil, they have used purposeful uh, fines addition uh, in their RCC because they don't have fly ash. So they did use ground fines um, there. So you may be able to find that documentation through the Furnace Laboratory uh, publications, where I believe they classified many different fines. Uh, not just limestone finds, I believe they used other finds as well. They did not contribute to cementitious action specifically. However, they did replace the cement finds in the uh, mixture itself, and they were able to reduce cement contents. Okay, thank you. I have one question, sir. Mm. Sir, when we put the ten layers of the with the cementitious materials, and in the meantime we have shortage of the fly gas or cementitious material, we can put the two layers of the with limestone upwards. Any effect on the layers about contraction and uh, shrinkage? Any effect? <laughs> I'm not specifically uh, sure I understand your uh, question uh, as to is it in the cementitious action of fines or as the uh, purely as a replacement of powder? Sir, my question is when we are the shortage of the fly gas. Yes. We put the limestone with the two two layers or three layers. Uh, with any effect of the uh, in between the two layers uh, due to uh, contraction or anything? There has been addition or there's been use of putting materials down on the layers uh, using cement in uh, soil cement in the United States with some impact on bonding, but not on RCC, to my knowledge, has, has that been widely used. A grout slurry has been effectively used between surfaces on many projects. If there was cement plus a uh, addition of fines, 
there would be some dilution effect. But as far as the grout, uh, cementitious grout, that has been quite effective. Thank you, Mr. Tim Jones, for your presentation. Now we conclude this session. Yeah, please. Now we conclude this session by thanking Mr. Tim Dolan for sparing his valuable time for conducting this particular session. I'm sure all the participants must have benefited from the presentation and the knowledge experiences shared during the program. Now we have the next presentation by the resource speaker, Mr. Christopher Hicks, presentation on RCC construction systems and automation. Let me introduce briefly about the speaker. Mr. Christopher Hicks has experience at many different levels of heavy civil construction, including both trade and managerial position, substantial RCC and hydropower construction experience on projects throughout North America, as well as South and Central America, Africa, Europe, Middle East and Asia, both unit rate as well as EPC method of project delivery. RCC dam and hydropower experience with generation capacities in excess of 1800 megawatts. Mr. Chris has been an integral part of two RCC projects, both planning and on-site construction that have won i -Cold International Milestone RCC Project Award. This award has been given to total of 12 projects to date out of 600 eligible. Authored several published papers regarding RCC dam construction and its application from a contractor's perspective. Current, his con current role is managing director for CIMIM mega projects with duties that include leading the R&D of industry 4.0 efforts and their application to dam and hydropower constructability improvement. CIMIM Mega Projects offers consultancy services for RCC dam and hydro projects to financiers, owners, engineers, and contractors for BIM and other services to plan, illustrate, qualify, and quantify major aspects of the construction process. These services include BIM applications for construction, simulation, and modeling, including 4D and 5D scheduling, as well as virtual and augmented reality, as well as on-site work. Mr. Chris is a member of ACI, American Concrete Institute, and USST, United States Society on Dams. Now I request my colleague to play the presentation received from Mr. Christopher Hicks. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this presentation for the virtual workshop Roller Compacted Concrete Dams. This presentation was prepared by Christopher Hicks, and we hope you enjoy the information presented. The presentation is about BIM, Building Information Modeling, and how it can be applied to RCC dam for tendering, planning, as well as the construction phases of a project. I am also going to talk about two case studies, namely the Chan 1 projects in Panama and the Gapgar project in India and the positive effect BIM usage has had on the projects. Both projects were mentioned in Monday's presentation by Dr. Dunstan and Dr. Shaw. The first question is, do we need to be using BIM in the construction industry and RCC dams in particular? 
To address the question, here is a slide from a report commissioned by Autodesk and FMI in the USA. They found that for the United States construction industry, approximately 17% of total project costs is lost due to missed schedules. This equates to approximately $165 billion in loss per year in the USA alone. This slide shows approximately the same percentage of loss value in the construction industry each year, approximately $1.6 trillion, but on a global scale. This assumes an approximate value of the entire world's construction industry of roughly $10 trillion per year. Of note is that the slide also reports that the increase in construction industry productivity has only increased 1% over the last 20 years. So, it seems the construction industry has plenty of room for improvement in the planning and execution of all areas of construction work. So, how can we use BIM for dams and hydropower, and how can BIM lower construction risk and costs, improve quality, as well as shorten schedules? Famous last words. Well, if we had known that, we would have done things differently. With BIM methods, you can know that, construction risk, potential problems, other critical issues, earlier, and mitigate it, solve the problem, before actual construction starts. BIM allows us to model the entire project from start to finish, including the construction process and methodology. All equipment and construction processes need to be successfully complete. The project can be modelled, simulated and reviewed before work starts. This all happens in a digital environment simulating the real world. What is so good about BIM methods compared to other planning and management methods? We have all heard a picture is worth a thousand words and seeing is believing. A picture, and better yet a 3D BIM model and a simulation, different from an animation, can convey more information more accurately with better understanding than written words. This is how human brain works, all of them. We went from this, communicating with each other by painting on stone walls, To this, a fully integrated BIM model with all permanent and temporary works modelled. This is a still image of the BIM model, but it is not static, rather dynamic and is modelled over time to simulate all the construction processes and stages. Costs can also be incorporated into the items of work to incorporate a 5D schedule. Some examples of BIM for permanent works versus construction planning, means and methods, and sequencing. Quite a few engineering firms have some level of BIM modelling incorporated into their design workflow. This is typically a good starting point for modelling of the contractor's means and methods, as the engineer's model is representative of the finished product and what is desired at the end of the project. With BIM, we practice building the project, think contractors, means, methods and sequencing, in the digital environment first. Then we have identified and addressed any issues in question, modified the model and simulation. We get a second chance when actual construction begins. This is a slide of the BIM model for the Chan 1 RCC dam nearing completion. You can see that many of the contractors' work areas are shown, including hall roads, excavation, RCC and conventional concrete planning, as well as temporary works of the batching and delivery system for the RCC. Again, the BIM model is dynamic and simulates all construction stages as well. This is a slide showing some of the dynamic aspects of a BIM model during the early stages of construction. You can see the simulated progress of the work, namely the hall road and other temporary earthworks, as well as permanent earthworks, various stages of the river diversion concrete construction. 
you can also see the river diversion sequencing, including upstream, downstream, and temporary coffer dams. So what can be modeled regarding construction operations and sequencing? In short, everything. Some examples have been quarries with their areas, volumes, and extraction methods, aggregate processing methods and processes, permanent and temporary earthworks, batching, delivery, and cooling for RCC and conventional concrete systems, as well as other construction processes and methodology associated with RCC dam projects, not directly associated with the dam construction, but in the critical path for successful project completion. There have not been any limitations encountered for modelling any part of the works on the past RCC projects where BIM methods have been desired. This is an example of the cement and fly ash bulk storage facilities, including truck traffic. The truck traffic modelling was integrated into the BIM model to evaluate the ability to handle the required number of trucks and allow for the required rate of the RCC batching and, and placement to be met. The actual turning radius and capacities of the trucks can be modeled to provide a true simulation rather than an animation and more closely simulate actual conditions. This is a picture of the actual truck traffic during construction showing unloading of the seven bulk trucks simultaneously. This indeed agrees with the BIM model studies of truck traffic and allowed for smooth operation of the bulk material handling and storage at the batch plant area without limiting the RCC production. A key area in almost all RCC dam construction is critical lift planning. BIM allows all critical lifts to be planned with actual crane models and actual crane capacities and charts. Simulations that can be recorded as video of the actual lifts to show the actual lifting sequence in the digital environment first before making the lifts. This is part of simulation involving a critical lift for RCT delivery system erection. Various scenarios were modelled to allow evaluation of different scenarios so that different aspects of the lift could be evaluated, including worker safety, crane and truck access, and when necessary stage. All of these conditions were analysed and accounted for with anticipated staging for equipment and materials. This is part of a simulation involving a critical lift for RCC delivery system dismantling. This model again incorporated the actual cranes used on site and their capacities, as well as space and height limitations imposed by both temporary and permanent construction. As for the cranes, trucks and load handling can be simulated before the actual lift to obtain a better understanding of the actual work and how it will be accomplished. This is a comparison of the BIM model simulation with the actual lift taking place. If you compare the BIM model with the actual picture of the lift taking place, you can see the close relationship between what was planned and what took place. This is perhaps a very good comparison to show the accuracy between BIM model planning compared to actual work and the advantages of utilising BIM methods for planning efforts. This shows a comparison of an early stage BIM model with a picture of the actual construction on the way. You can see that indeed the actual construction followed the BIM model very closely, with the BIM model refined in areas as detailed was needed. The BIM model was used extensively throughout construction as a continual reference for planning and executing the work. Here is an example of some of the ways that BIM models can be shared with team members to gain understanding into the modelling and sequencing of the work. Hyperlinks have been added to this slide to show various vantage points of the model stored in the cloud and can be accessed by those that the model can be investigated from different points of view. This leads to a better understanding of the model and sequencing of the work by all team members.
This short video shows a flyover view of the entire site during the advanced stage of a construction for the RCC dam in the BIM model, showing the major areas of work including all RCC batching and delivery. It also shows an example of a viewing dome where the BIM model can be viewed at a one-to-one -one scale to allow viewers to get a feel for the actual scale of the work, complexity and level of effort rather than on a desktop view. This is a short video showing the simulated construction of the RCC dam in its entirety. The sequencing of the placement is shown in three distinct stages, as well as details showing when and where the delivery system will be raised to allow for complete placement of the RCC dam. This is a short video showing a virtual reality walkthrough of a portion of the RCC delivery system. The viewer's perspective starts at the bulk storage area near the batch plant and progresses as they walk along one of the RCC delivery system conveyors leading to the dam. At the peak elevation on the conveyor belt, the viewer pauses and looks around at the project back at the plant area and then back to the dam. This is a view of the BIM model on a handheld mobile device, such as an iPad, to allow viewing and inspection of the model in a larger area than a desktop, such as a conference room floor or meeting area. The mobile device is used to navigate through the model as desired so any area can be inspected closely from any angle. This is a short video showing a batch plant in an urban setting here in London, geolocated and at the actual scale. This allows the viewing of actual equipment and structures on site in an augmented reality environment. Unfortunately, this video was taken during lockdown, so the actual site location could not be visited. Here are a few slides relating to additional aspects of the RCC dam construction namely the planning and construction of a floating bulk storage terminal for the RCC materials and how BIM methods were integrated into the scope of work as well. A traditional study was first done of the available port facilities 
with BIM work following this effort, namely modelling the existing port facilities as terminal facilities. A complete BIM model of the existing port facilities was created to show how the planned temporary shore-based bulk materials handling infrastructure would be located and interact with the existing facilities. The BIM model was also used in the community meetings to explain the planning and operation of the facility to obtain community input and address concerns. The BIM model was also used for submission to the Panama Canal Authority for permit approval. A complete BIM model of the floating terminal was also created including the simulation of incoming cement and fly ash delivery ships. The entire model of the floating terminal was used to modify an existing barge and facilitate its conversion to allow storage and transfer of the cement and fly ash. The floating terminal was able to receive the bulk cement and flash from the delivery ships and then store and transport it pneumatically to shore facilities for truck loading and then further transportation to the dam site. This is a view from the end of the floating terminal looking towards the shore-based truck loading facilities. The floating terminal is connected to the shore-based facilities with a floating pipeline with one pipeline each for cement and fly ash. You can see from the existing facilities were very close to the temporary facilities and the BIM model contributed to accurately working within these close proximities. Once again, you can see in this slide the BIM model for the project site. And here is a picture of the actual site. You can see that the actual site work and construction followed very closely to that of the BIM model. Here are a few short selection of slides of the project over time from various vantage points. RCC placement taking place at night nearing the dam completion. After completion, spilling at night. One other significant project that I am sure is of interest, and Dr. Dunstan mentioned yesterday, is the Gatgar project in Maharashtra. This is a picture of the main dam from the downstream right abutment during a visit after construction was completed. This is a picture of the site near the completion of the RCC placement. It shows the main dam, the RCC delivery system and batch plants. Some of the left abutment excavation works can also be seen. The previous pictures compare here with the BIM model created during the planning of the dam. Although at this time BIM technology was in its infancy, a working model was still able to be constructed with the early methods. The model here shows the batch plants and planned conveyor line to the main delivery system and then to the main RCC dam. Here is a view of the BIM model showing more detail of the batch plant and conveyor system area for the RCC delivery. The BIM model was used extensively during the planning stages for the RCC dam as well as the construction phase. 
The BIM model facilitated the actual works and proved very valuable in evaluating special features of the dam and delivery system, as well as the cement and fly ash deliveries and aggregate cooling efforts. One of the takeaways from the GAPCAR project was its success for all parties. This slide shows a quote from an international symposium from the client noting the success of the project. Due to the selection of the RCC dam construction, in lieu of conventional concrete or masonry dams, the project has benefited by three years early of commissioning, therefore generation of 1,350 million units, the cost of which 5,200 million Indian rupees. This is equal to about half of the cost of the project. This clearly tells of the success story of the RC in hydro and project. When do we use BIM? As soon as possible in the project life. BIM can be utilized to study the project from the very earliest stages of feasibility all the way through to construction. This includes feasibility and tender stages and is perhaps where some of the greatest advantage can be realized. What software do you use? This is probably the most asked question and it's a very simple answer. It's not about the software. Many different software platforms exist and different approaches may require different software and platforms. BIM is a process, an approach and a method. It can be accomplished at many different levels of detail with many different tools. The software tools are like other tools. The person using them determines the effectiveness and success of the outcome. BIM is still susceptible to the saying, garbage in, garbage out. Conclusion. Measure twice, cut once. With BIM, you measure and simulate construction exactly as you would build the real project, many more times than twice in a digital environment. We'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. With BIM, you can cross the bridges beforehand before you reach the bridge. Well, if we had known that, we would have done things differently. If you model and simulate the construction with BIM methods, you can know and you can revise plans before you actually start. The takeaway. Using BIM for both the permanent design as well as construction planning reduces the project risk for all project stakeholders, leads to better quality, less time and less cost. This benefits everyone involved with the project and helps achieve everyone's goals and requirements. Thank you for your kind attention. Hopefully this brief presentation has been beneficial for your future projects. Thank you for making a magnificent and detailed presentation on RCC construction system and automation. May we proceed further for the question answer session? May I request to the participants for their questions, please? We have one hand raised by Mr. Vinay Kumar. Please proceed. Mr. Vinay Kumar. Sir, which BIM software is uh, uh, mostly useful in hydro project? Well, I think it's different software and different approaches are for different structures and different items, I would say. Um, you know, there's different ones that are more structural. There's ones that are more for earthquake, uh, earthworks. 
There's some that are do very well for steel structures. Some are more for concrete structures. So I don't think uh, that there's really, you know, a, a, a particular flavor or anything like that. I think it's more of, as it said in the slide of the tool, um, you know, it's like a hammer. Um, the, the person swinging the hammer is probably more important than the hammer itself. Sir, is a rivet can be useful in a hydro project? I, I didn't catch the first part of that. Uh, rivet, rivet, Autodesk, rivet is can be oh. useful for hydro project. Well, again, uh, hydro project. Well, the short answer is yes, but the the more complete answer is hydro projects have a lot of different you know items and needs in that. So, again, with the software, it's not a it's not a, a one size fits all type of thing. It's more of an approach. But um, Revit, some of the modeling that you saw in there was done with Revit. A bunch of it was not done with Revit. So, you know, it really depends on the task at hand and then combining those all into basically a virtu a digital twin of the model. So it's, like I say, using a, maybe a, a, a hammer for one thing, a screwdriver for something else, and maybe a spanner uh, in another uh, application. So it's uh, it, it, again, it's not about the software. Software is, you, is the tool that you use, but there's many different types and many different kinds and many different approaches and many different needs and results. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. Sure, you're welcome. Any further question? Dr. Malcolm wants to ask something. Sir, please. Dr. Malcolm, you may please ask. Yep. I think. I really wanted to make a point about the value of time. Chris made a very, uh, included a very important slide within his presentation regarding the Gatgar project. When because RCC was used, there was a three year saving in time and that saving in time was equal to half the cost of the project, not the dam, the total project. Yes, uh, earlier today we saw the Sonla project in, in Marco Conrad's presentation. Now the Sonla project was 2,400 megawatts and the project was finished one year early. During that one year, $400 million worth of power was generated. And an extraordinary thing happened then the Prime Minister of uh, Vietnam then gave the next project called Lai Chau Upstream, which Marco Conrad also mentioned, without bidding because of the success of Son La. Lai Chau was equally successful. That was also finished a year early and $200 million worth of power was generated ahead of schedule. This should be considered when someone is reviewing bidding for any construction or any design. For example, someone say, oh, we've saved $100,000 by choosing this particular designer relative to that one. $100,000 on a large project such as Son La is worth two hours. Two hours. You save, you think half a million dollars during the design process. That is 12 hours. It's far more important to get the right people to do the design and construction than try and save, in relative terms, minuscule amounts of money 
in the early stages of the project. Just a comment. I would uh, follow up with uh, what Dr. Dunstan said, uh, two things. One is that uh, while we used BIM methods on GATCAR, I don't want to pin everything on because we used BIM on how much of a success it was, so, but certainly it was a key. Um, it was a contractor who had no RCC experience before, so I think that the BIM methods as well as a lot of other methods really helped out with the success of the project. Another question, um, uh, it, going back to the presentation, one of the pro uh, questions that we get is, you know, what software? And as I said, it's software is a tool. Uh, there's lots of different tools out there. It's not so important. It's really the person using the tool or the entities uh, using the tool. Um, the other thing is, well, what does it cost? And I think that I think that Malcolm actually answered that question. Well, it, it doesn't cost anything. It's free. Uh, it, it generates money. It doesn't cost money. Uh, you know, when you when you save, you know, you, when you save hours, uh, days, maybe even weeks and months uh, on a large project, the value of that is is huge. Uh, the value of that time. So all the efforts and things like that that go into this type of thing pales into the comparison of how much money that it saves. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm Dunstan and Mr. Christopher Hicks for making this question answer session very interactive. I would like to convey my special thanks to Mr. Christopher Hicks for sparing his precious time for conducting this session. Thank you, sir. Now we have the last presentation by the resource speaker, Dr. Quentin Shah, Vice President Icon, Committee on Concrete Dam. I would like to request my colleague to play the presentation received from Dr. Quentin Shah, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's Quentin Shaw uh, again, and I'm going to be presenting the final closing chapter in this RCC workshop and I'm going to be presenting a workshop summary which really looks to take a very high level view of the very detailed and comprehensive presentations that we have had over the last three days and really to distill out the general important points that come out from uh, an overview of all of these uh, detailed matters. I will start by reminding us just very basically in, and in principle, uh, each of the presentations that were made as part of this uh, workshop. I'll then look at some of the key, the major issues that relate to developments in, in RCC and that are covered in Bulletin 177. I'll then talk very briefly about Bulletin 177 and then go on to say a final word. And in this final word, I will try to summarize these broad principles that uh, really should be considered when um, implementing RCC dams on the basis of the individual presentations made. We started the workshop by hearing about world trends in RCC dams from Dr. Malcolm Dunstan. And then I gave a very brief basic introduction to Bulletin 177, the new IPOL Bulletin on RCC dams. I then went on to, to present on the subject of RCC dam design, and that presentation was followed by 
a presentation by Michael Rogers on RCC Dam rehabilitation and raising and realistically other uses of RCC in the sphere of dam construction. Then Francisco Ortega spoke to us comprehensively about materials and mixed proportioning for RCC. And then we he heard uh, from Rafael Ibanez de Aldocoa on the very big and extensive subject of RCC dam construction, following which we heard from Dr. Marco Conrad on RCC quality control. The presentations continued to take us into the subject of RCC dam performance, which uh, for which Timothy Dolan led us through. The final presentation made as part of sort of the main body of the workshop presentations was then RCC construction systems and automation and BIM aspects of uh, RCC dam construction. And that was presented by Christopher Hicks. And then finally, we finished with this summary uh, presented to you by myself. Moving on to talk about the key issues raised in the presentations. And I'm not going to go through and look at the key issues uh, presentation by presentation, but to look at the very macro summary of what, uh, what are the key facts, factors to come through these series of presentations. And the workshop has covered a very comprehensive range of subject matter related to RCC dams and the current state of the art of RCC dam design and construction and all other issues related to RCC dams. While we hope that the full messages have come through strongly in the presentations made, the very small number of RCC dams to date that can really be considered successful provides evidence that success in RCC dams is not so simple. And the presentation included many lessons learned in all aspects of RCC dams. But the key lesson is that you need experience and the necessary levels of knowledge to make RCC dams work efficiently and effectively. In terms of trends, we heard that realistically the two RCCs at either end of the spectrum, high cementitious RCC and hard fill or cemented materials dams, that these two types of RCC are growing in popularity while all other types are reducing in terms of the total percentage of RCC dams implemented to date. And certainly the design of an RCC dam is not actually as simple as originally and perhaps generally considered and many related lessons have been learnt over the years. And while simplicity is repeated as an essential requirement for success in RCC dams, clearly there are several other very important issues that must be considered all the way from feasibility studies, through the design studies, through the uh, mix proportioning studies and the mixed trial studies, all the way through to construction and a very comprehensive knowledge of RCC mixes and RCC construction is a necessary requirement on the part of the RCC dam designer. Important information and examples were presented to illustrate the very significant flexibility of RCC for rehabilitation, foundation replacement and dam raising, as well as the many other applications in which RCC can be of great benefit on a dam construction site. And when discussing RCC mix design, the greater related understanding and the more comprehensive requirements that have developed in this regard were clearly apparent, with a completely different thinking that can be can seen to have developed since the early days of RCC dam construction and the very much more comprehensive approach in analyzing the materials that form part of our concrete mixes compared to those that were typically applicable for conventional mass concrete. An extensive expansion of the chapter on RCC dam construction in Bulletin 177 compared to Bulletin 126 
is a clear reflection of the developments that have taken place in this part of RCC Dam engineering in recent years. Quality control is an absolute key requirement of RCC dam construction, although the number of leaking RCC dams in the world demonstrates that the necessary related requirements are often not fully achieved. Substantially more quantitative information is now available in respect of dam performance, building a better understanding of effective procedures and the related requirements. And an area in which particular development has taken place in recent years relates, of course, to dam plant and construction systems and the related automation thereof. So I called Bulletin 177 has now replaced Bulletin 126 as the definitive bulletin uh, describing and gu providing guidelines on roller compacted concrete dams. And that with RCC effectively replacing CVC, conventional mass concrete, for gravity dams in the interve intervening period. And hopefully, Bulletin 177 will prove to be as useful in stimulating development and good practice in RCC dam design and construction, as was the very successful Bulletin 126. Bulletin 177 is a very comprehensive uh, ICOL bulletin, and it provides very useful guidance describing in detail the requirements for successful RCC dams. And so, as a final word, I'd like to say that the presentations that we've seen over the last three days have provided a very detailed insight into the opportunities and requirements of RCC dam design and construction. But please bear in mind, the combined engineering experience behind these presentations is approximately 300 years. It may all sound simple, but in reality, it only looks simple when high quality people are involved. People who know what is coming next, what risks to look for, and how to preempt those risks before they impact, impact our projects. And all of the presenters will tell you that you cannot design or build an RCC dam from a book. Each dam and each set of circumstances will bring new challenges and require adaptive thinking. There are no formulas for mixed design that are universally applicable. It is always necessary to run a comprehensive mixed development program and strengths, strength gain rates, setting times and stress relaxation creep will vary even for materials that may seem very similar on paper. I would like to say a final word of thanks to the excellent and dedicated team behind Bulletin 177, and particularly to those involved in the presentations as part of this In Cold RCC workshop. These are world-class RCC engineers and the top of the dam's profession and each has dedicated great efforts in preparing what I'm sure that you will all agree to be a set of excellent presentations. And so I thank you all for attending this series of presentations, this RCC workshop. I thank INCOLD for putting this series of presentations together. I think it has been extremely useful and I trust that these presentations and this information will go a good way to making sure that future RCC dams are only successful and that RCC dams as they become implemented more in India are nothing but uh, successful. With the information that we have now, uh, with the experiences that we have from RCC construction today, that all RCC dams going forward uh, are successful. We certainly are in a place where they can be and that they deserve to be. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Kuantinsha. We would like to convey our special thanks to Dr. Kuantinsha, Vice President, ICOL Committee on Concrete Dams, who is the source behind this workshop and help in cold in mobilization of world renowned experts to this workshop and also sparing 
the valuable time for conducting three days virtual session on applicability and feasibility of roller compacted concrete dams, which was very educative, informative and illuminating. On behalf of INCOL, we also express our gratitude to the dignitaries and world-renowned resort speakers and experts, including President of the International Commission on Large Dams, I called, Mr. Michael Rogers, Dr. Malcolm Dunstan, longest serving member on the ICOL Committee on Concrete Dams and chairman of the committee that drafted ICOL Bulletin number 109 and 126. Member of the Spanish and the German National Committee on Large Dam, Mr. Francisco Ortega. Managing Director for CIMEM Mega Projects, Mr. Christopher Hicks. Chairman of Span Coal's Technical Committee on Concrete Dams, Mr. Raffel Aldico. President of Dolan and Associates and author of ICOL Bulletin 177, Chapter 7, Mr. Tim Dolan and co-founder of ICOL's Young Engineers Forum, Mr. Marco Conrad. Thank you all. Thank you to all the participants for attending the three-day virtual session. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye to all.